Okay, I'm going to do this a little bit different than I normally do. What I'm going to do is walk through some of the very basic stuff we saw in our case this week and compare it to the differential diagnosis slash workup for spasms, convulsions, seizures, whatever you want to call them. Now, I've, I've seen uh, different terminology used in by different uh, textbooks, different authors. So in the algorithmic diagnosis, the word convulsions is preferred over either spasms or seizures, and seizures was considered a subtype of convulsions, and so several different things can cause that. But if you're looking for information about infants, uh, neonates, you're usually going to find it listed as spasm. I didn't take the time to go through and, and flesh out each of these words and figure out exactly what their definition, etymology, or anything like that. I just, just use them interchangeably until somebody corrects you and calls you uh, not smart. Second thing is, these are all one group, so spasms, convulsions, seizures, this is, I'm considering this as one group, and then these paroxysmal events as another group, so we're going to break this down a little bit. Okay, so how did the case present? We had an infant that was being evaluated for seizures. I feel like I'm missing something. There, that's better. Today is my son's eighth birthday. This was when he was uh, about two or three weeks old. He had a little jaundice. He had to get the uh, lamp put on him and, and clear up all that little darkened Billy Rubin under his skin, but he came out of it just fine. So what I want you to pay attention to is uh, basically the things I have written here. The age, it was three weeks old. So what causes spasm convulsion seizures in a three-week-old? There was back arching. This is a, a clue towards something we're going to look at. It happened after feeding. This is another big clue. Now what you would typically rule up with these two symptoms, this symptom right here is going to rule down just a little bit. We're going to take a look at how all that fits together as well. Onset was about a week after birth, so that's kind of a clue. It's not a strong clue, but it's kind of a clue. And I think this may be a distractor. I'm not sure. I know somebody's going to be doing a, an objective on formulas. But the fact that he switched from infamil lipple to, infamil, to gentle ease, um, it would rule up some a, a specific cause of these spasm convulsion seizures, but it would not not what the ultimate diagnosis was. So I think it's a red herring. Okay, so symptoms got progressively worse, and he was started on renatidine by his pediatrician. Took one dose yesterday. Today, and I know I'm saying he. I'm got my picture of my boy here. In our case, she. She started on it yesterday, and then today she had a really bad um, spasm, and it lasted for a lot longer than normal. I don't think the medicine caused that, but I think the medicine, if it was uh, what the pediatrician thought it was, then I think the medicine would have, uh, count would have counteracted it. So your differential diagnosis for spasm convulsion seizures in an infant is going to basically be two things. So you're going to have real seizures, and then you're going to have this group called non-seizure paroxysmal events. What is non-seizure paroxysmal event? Let me break that down to you. It's shaking, spasm, convulsion, seizures that are not really seizures, they're from something else. So there's your mini medical terminology. And if we wanted to be really true to the uh, medical terminology world, we would call it a seizure paroxysmal event. The prefix a means negative. It's the Greek negative particle. This is the first time I saw my son. I had just got back from the Persian Gulf and he was born about a month before I returned. You're not allowed to grow facial hair in the military, so I went ahead and put in so you guys would recognize me. And now my son's looking at me like, who is this guy? Okay, so instead of, uh, we're going to look first at the seizures, then we're going to look at the non-seizure paroxysmal events. If it's a true seizure, you should be able to tell that from an EEG. If it's a non-seizure paroxysmal event, you, you can use an EEG to rule out a real seizure. Sometimes the clinical manifestation is going to be so, com so obvious that you're not going to need an EEG at all. So uh, the largest portion of seizures are going to be idiopathic. No one really knows why. And I want you to think of these things as vascular, brain, or metabolic. So if we don't know why, if we've ruled out that we don't know why, we're actually we've got to rule out everything else before we can say we don't know why. 
So what are the things we're going to rule out? We're going to rule out a stroke or other vascular event in the brain. This could also include migraines. Now I know what you're thinking. Strokes, that's what happens to old people. You know, old people like this guy. But you can actually get strokes even pre-birth. Uh, pre you can get, a uh, baby can have a stroke before delivery. In fact, me being from a small town of 6,000, I know a kid, he's doing quite well by the way, but I know a kid that had a stroke before he was ever born. Now if I, before I ever came to medical school, know a kid from a town of 6,000 that had a stroke before he was born, it's probably a little bit more common than, than what I would have thought. So then we're going to move on to brain. So with the brain, with the, with the CNS, what are we looking at? We're looking at a tumor, trauma, or infection. A mnemonic you might use is brain tit. My caveat with that is if that offends somebody, I in no way mean or intend to offend anybody. This is just useful as a mnemonic to help you in aiding your memory. Now, infection, this includes a lot of things. It includes encephalopathies. It includes uh, also just a fever, so you can have a febrile seizure. Now, let's make a little bit of room and talk about the, uh, let's talk about the metabolic. So, within metabolic causes, you, wanna, you got four things that could be low, one thing that could be high. This is just in general. The, this is not the end-all, be-all list, but low sugar, low oxygen, so hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, hypocalcemia, hyponatremia, or uremia, or ammonia. So in review, if we have a positive EEG, we're going to look at the brain, the vessels, and the metabolism. If we can rule out those three things, we're going to probably lean towards idiopathic. In our case, we found a low calcium. This was due to DeGeorge syndrome. I love that word DeGeorge. It makes me think of the abominable snowman cartoons when I was a kid. DeGeorge, I'm gonna love him and kiss him and hug him and keep him. Anyhow, I digress. We didn't end up having to do an EEG because by the time we got the electrolyte levels back, we knew the cause of the spasm convulsion seizures. You think if I say spasm convulsion seizures long enough, it'll stick? And here's my son just after he turned about a year old, climbing onto the table to get a piece of cake or something. Okay, so non-seizure paroxysmal events. This is uh, various things that can happen that may or may not be an exact true seizure. The first one, as you can see, we have breath holding. This is uh, going to cause a true seizure because remember, low oxygen is a metabolic thing that can cause seizures. The thing with this is that it presents right around six months to three years. So in our case, three weeks old, if the brain's working fine, there's not going to be a baby holding their breath for any good reason. Tourette's, we can rule that down from the family history. Parasomias is another word for night terrors, and it also has sleepwalking and stuff. This usually starts right around three years. Nightmares is just a, le uh, a less severe form of night terrors, so right around three years. Now, most of these things are going to have normal EEGs. Migraine is going to be an exception. When you have migraines, if they're associated with the vasculature, then you can also have um, EEGs that are epileptiform. In fact, migraines and epilepsy are sometimes linked, so if you have an occipital epileptic uh, seizure, then you can also have occipital migraines. They're, they're not, one doesn't cause the other, they're just highly correlated and associated. Benign nocturnal myoclonus, this is just generalized jerking and spasming in your sleep. Sometimes it requires uh, video monitoring for the physician to watch, so a nighttime video monitoring, and sometimes it can even require an EEG to distinguish it. Shuddering attacks, these kind of look like shivering. They may be a forerunner to uh, other kinds of seizures. Here's my son at his first birthday party. Again, I went ahead and drew in the beard so you guys would recognize me. And look how small his feet are. Now the big red herring, Sandifer syndrome. We're going to come back to this, I think. Don't kids just scare you to death sometimes? 
Infantile masturbation can look like seizures. I know that would scare me to death. The source on this says that observation by a skilled individual, sometimes even in a hospital setting, may be necessary to distinguish from seizures. I just want to say, if you're skilled at detecting infantile masturbation, I question you. Here's my son right around the age of three. Photo uh, by photographer Matt Diamond. I gotta plug him, he's my cousin. And he does really good photography. So now, psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. This has a wide variety of presentations, everything from shaking to writhing. At times they can be hard to distinguish from a seizure, and at other times they're so bizarre that they're easily distinguished. In these, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you can actually precipitate these seizures in a controlled setting by injecting with normal saline. And temper tantrums, that's psychological, not, uh, not neurological. If you have benign proxismal vertigo, Usually, you can, uh, if you can get a, a calorics test in this age group, which is going to be difficult, you're going to see probably problems on one side or both. And lastly, although it's not uh, a spasmatic convulsive seizure, it, some kids have staring spells. Usually, if they ha have difficulty learning, they'll have staring spells at school. And this can be mistaken for a petite mall seizure. And here's my eight-year-old boy today holding his little brother. And just on the odds that he grows up and remembers that I wasn't with him on his eighth birthday, at least he's going to know somehow that I was thinking of him. We also have proof in this photo that Superman is stronger than Batman. So let's go back to Sandifer syndrome really quick. This is what the pediatrician thought was the problem. What happens is you got a kid that has GERD and the baby is so young and the nervous system is so underdeveloped that they're having pain but they don't know how to respond to the pain. So they can do everything from arch their back to spasm. They can stop breathing or e and become dyspneic or tachypneic. And one of the big clues in this is that it happens after eating. So when the formula was changed and it said it went away, well, yeah, it went away for a day, but what were these spasms happening every day? And then after that day or so, they switched back to the lipple. That's why I think the little note about it going away with the changing formula was a huge red herring.